Chief of Defense Staff, Commander of the Army, Commander of the Navy and Air Force, Your Excellencies, Foreign Ambassadors, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Ayuboal, good morning. Please allow me to begin by making a confession. I have been to many countries so far, but I've never felt so welcomed as I felt here in Sri Lanka. And I would like to thank you both for your hospitality, for sharing with me and with all the guests your amazing culture, and for the invitation to this extraordinary event. Distinguished Auditorium, our society is now at a most dangerous crossroads. We have two options to choose from. We can either share a common effort and go to a further, better pathway, or we can become selfish, ignore the others, and go into a very dark abyss. As we were looking at the topics of the first session, conflict and cooperation, you can easily understand that the two paths that are just in front of us are either conflict or cooperation towards a better, uh, brighter, peaceful and secure future. Today, I'm going to speak to you about the Asia-Pacific security landscape, putting the frames of those two concepts, those two choices that we do have to make, either conflict or cooperation. The aims of my presentations today will be to assess the Asian Pacific security landscape and to discuss afterwards a pretty unusual actor in this region, which is the European Union. And thirdly, because I never provide a presentation, a paper or article without recommending based on my own perception and expertise, um, I would try to present to you some uh, policy resolutions. The structure of the presentation would definitely uh, be in the following way. We will begin by assessing the Asia-Pacific security landscape, would we'll follow by analyzing the role of the EU in the region, and would we'll further go into the policy recommendations. The topic of Asia-Pacific security uh, landscape, it's actually a very complex topic. So I had to structurize this complex um, topic with three questions. First, what is the relevance of the Asia Pacific, um, the region of the Asia Pacific in the global security landscape? Secondly, what are the main threats in the Asia Pacific security architecture? And finally, how prepared is the region to fight against the current and emerging threats? To begin with, For many Asia-Pacific nations, we do know that domestic security challenges are becoming blurred with regional and global external security considerations. The complexity and dilemmas that characterize the global security ecosystem and has been uh, emphasized, underlined before, um, actually are the same in the case of the region of Asia-Pacific, and they request the same cooperation and inter, in, uh, the cooperation that results from the interconnected uh, relation. Asia-Pacific security landscape is not just a regional concern. We should be aware of the fact that it is affected and, in its turn, affects the global, global security landscape in the same way. So we have one of the world's most dynamic regions uh, with population growth, economic progress, urbanization, industrialization, um, with a high demand of resources such as food, water, energy, and these all bring up significant security concerns. If we look at the general characteristics at the Asia Pacific region, which is stretching from Asia in the east, Oceania in the south, and the Americas in the west, 
is widely considered as the world's most dynamic region. Um, the Asia Pacific not only covers upper, approximately 52% of Earth's surface and 59% of its total population, but it also uh, represents the powerhouse of the global economy, accounting for approximately 59% of the global GDP, 49 of world trade, um, and the East Asia and the Pacific region uh, accounts for approximately two-fifths of the global economic growth as well. Not to forget, the region is also the hub of many of the global value chains in, for instance, the Apple and footwear, hardware, food, electronics, and automotive industries. With such a complex identity and roles, you can imagine that transnational security challenges are shaping the security, both regionally and globally, and they're doing it for the Asia Pacific as well. The significance of emerging transnational security challenges in the Asia Pacific has a global impact. And conversely, security developments in other regions affect the Asia Pacific security landscape in the same way. So what are exactly the main threats that affect Asia-Pacific or that raise from the Asia-Pacific region? As a lecturer in national security and global security, um, when I define the concept of security, I go into its variation into different dimensions of it. And I can assure you that in the Asia-Pacific, uh, looking at the security landscape, I can tell you that you en it encompasses all the dimensions of security. You have national security, energy, water, food, health, human security, environmental security, economic security, and they all mingle and um, interconnect with each other in the most complex ways. It is just like an ecosystem where you have very many threats. You have a variety of threats that are both traditional and non-traditional, and they all mingle with each other in um, a system that is very similar to the natural one. All the threats that you would follow at the global scale and that have been um, observed so far, I have here in front of you um, a report from the threats that were reserved for the 2016 and 17. All of these you can follow and see in the Asia Pacific region as well. You also have the Asia Pacific criminal threats that actually enter more into my um, subject of expertise um, as an expert in terrorism and counterterrorism. I can tell you that because of the, you know, the borders um, and the transporting threats, um, you, can, you have a variety of crimes that you would be able to follow and see, and its developments are very, very dangerous both for the region and for the global uh, security as well. So how prepared is Asia Pacific for what we see? How prepared is for the you know, environmental threats? Uh, from, from those transborder threats that we have seen and that, that were very well emphasized by the, the speakers that were before me today as well. I can tell you that however prepared you feel as a nation or as a, or as a region, you can never be as much prepared as you, you would be in a collaboration or in a cooperation with the other countries and regions. So according to the nature of threats that we face today in such a globalized world, the only approach that we should go towards would be a global one, would be a cooperation and based one. Because there's no threats, mostly international ones, that we can tackle on our own. I'm sure the military, military friends here are very familiarized with the concept um, that's the perfect way to describe the current security landscape in Asia Pacific and not only at the, lo at the global level as well. You have volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And all this at a very complex and international scale. So however, or as many organizations you'd have within interregional or um, international organizations we have in the region, they're still not sufficient enough in order to face those threats. So we always have to communicate and share 
the knowledge that we have, the experiences, and you know, come hand to, come hand, to hand in order to face those threats. I know there have been many actors in the region, and many would rush into talking about the US, China, and other powerful actors that we've been witnessing in the past years. However, not because I'm nationally Romanian, but just because I think we always, like, we always need to look for other options as well. Um, I thought that it would be very interesting to discuss how the EU would be able to you know, play an active role for Asia-Pacific security landscape as well. The European Union is a unique economic and political union uh, between 28 EU countries. Um, the United Kingdom is still a member of the EU. Um, all, all those countries are together and they cover much of the, of the, of the continent. Multilateral institutions or cooperation frameworks have become part of the diplomatic toolbox for Asia, which opens a natural dimension for the EU engagement based on its own history and experience. But it's actually farther more behind the reasoning of me choosing the EU today. When we talk about security landscapes and defense, the EU has been recently trying to redefine its role and its actions at the global scale and in the defense sector as well. Acting as a global soft balancer, pursuing a principled, albeit interest-based policy anchored in international law and the rule of law in general, striving to support regional or multilateral solutions with cooperative diplomacy and soft integration, the EU can offer a complementary approach to politics in Asia quite different from major powers competing for supremacy. And it's not just one side relation that we are looking at. Cooperation should be on both sides and should benefit the both sides. So when I was re um, considering the policy recommendations, the things that can be done uh, when we have the two sides, the Asia Pacific and the European Union, I considered first what the EU can and should be doing in its trial to become a global actor, to do more, not, in, not just in the economical, political, diplomatic level, but at the same time in the defense sector. Um, then I, was, I looked at what Asia Pacific can do towards the European Union. And then thirdly, and maybe the most important, I looked at the way both of them, like both sides, can actually work together and progress. So, firstly, for the EU, EU hasn't been known for much involvement in the Asia Pacific so far. So, what it needs, it, needs, it definitely needs to develop a new strategy, that, a new narrative that can fit into what it's already planning. It fits into the global strategy that has been already promoting. Um, in this way, it can definitely promote more effective and credible contribution to the Asian security and to the Asia Pacific security as well. Uh, what do I mean by the new narrative, efficient narrative? I mean strengthening and participating in a developing regional architecture, contributing to conflict management through upholding the rule of law, assuring cybersecurity, and connecting with our in conjunction with Asian uh, connectivity could, that could be a viable selection. Actually, the EU has played a very important role in other parts of the world, in the Middle East. It has experience in working as a mediator in various conflicts, and it's now trying new and new roles. So, the Asia Pacific might offer Turkey, the my, uh, might offer the EU the possibility to develop this narrative and to develop its global strategy. In the case of Asia Pacific, Understanding that in today's globalized world, only a global approach can provide effectiveness and can influence um, our choices. You know, even big states, when they face up so, global, so much global threat, they feel very small. So in the case of the global security context, Asia Pacific does need um, to look into different directions and to see what other options it has, and it should definitely um, get into as much cooperation as possible, because as I was trying to um, 
promote from the beginning of this presentation, I was telling you about the two roads. Actually, cooperation would get us two steps ahead. So choosing cooperation over conflict would be the best way, although it is the most difficult one. So what happens when we have this on both sides? Or what can, do, can those two sides do? They definitely have, should develop a common platform of dialogue uh, that should not be limited to, you know, already known subjects, topics, fields like economy, um, politics, diplomacy, and just defense and security. Um, they should be as open as possible to the new, um, the new trends of our global um, context. So in this way, the new platform of dialogue should be an option and at the same time a challenge and an opportunity for development and evolution. The only way in which you can do this is by having a common effort on both sides. And I truly believe that although, um, actually the first uh, keynote uh, speaker, um, great speech, uh, very relaxed one, very uh, a beautiful speech actually, um, he drove the, um, the future in his words. Um, and it doesn't really have to be that way. Like, you know, if we realize and acknowledge that our future is actually in our hands, that the Asia-Pacific security landscape, for example, it looks in this way now. It's an ecosystem with mixture, a mixture of threats, which are not traditional ones. We have more asymmetric threats than the traditional one. And I can, I can assure you of that, as my focus of research is uh, Daesh, and I've been looking into uh, Daesh recent activity um, in Asia-Pacific, uh, just as an example. So when you have all those threats, you should keep your options as open as possible and should, you should look for partners for cooperation in order to get to the right path. So I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, I would like to thank you again for the invitation to participate and to share my expertise. And again, Sri Lanka, you're such a beautiful country. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you.